Welcome. In this short video, I'm going to show you how to draw the Lewis structures of ionic compounds, and then from that, write the chemical formulas of these compounds. Also, I'll show you how we determine whether a bond is ionic or covalent or polar covalent using three simple systems, and I'll show you which one of these is best. So, let's take an example of compound in which magnesium is going to form with oxygen, we look up the group number of the representative element on the periodic table. Magnesium is in group 2A, so it has two valence electrons. And representative element metals want to empty the valence shell to become isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas, and so magnesium will do that, releasing two electrons and forming an Mg2 plus ion. At the same time, oxygen, we find, is in group 6A. It has six valence electrons, and being a nonmetal, it would like to gain two electrons to fill its valence shell. And if it's combined with a metal, it'll likely do that, forming an oxide 2 minus ion. So the cations and anions will always combine in a ratio such that the total positive charge is equal to the total negative charge. And so this is a simple uh, combination here, one-to-one -one ratio. Here is the Lewis structure of magnesium oxide. From that, we can write the chemical formula. Now, the chemical formula would simply be MgO in a one-to-one -one ratio. We never put ones in a formula if they're understood. And we don't carry down the charges or the non-bonded electrons into the chemical formula. The name of this compound is simply magnesium oxide. Let's look now at a compound formed between lithium and nitrogen. It'll be another ionic compound combining a metal and a nonmetal. Lithium we find in group 1A with one valence electron, and we know it would like to empty the valence shell, losing one electron, and form a lithium plus one cation. At the same time, nitrogen is a group 5A nonmetal. It would like to gain three electrons to fill its valence shell to become isoelectronic with neon and form a nitride 3 minus anion. Obviously, they will not combine in a one-to-one -one ratio. We'll need three lithium cations to combine with one nitride anion. So if we multiply this first equation by three, we'll write three lithium atoms, release three electrons, forming three lithium cations. And notice how the number of electrons to be gained by the nonmetal will be the same as the number of electrons released by the metal. And then the combining ratio of 3 to 1 lithium to nitride will give us the Lewis structure of lithium nitride. And here is then the chemical formula Li3N and the name lithium nitride. Let's take a look at beryllium bonding with nitrogen. Now beryllium, like magnesium, is in group 2A and has two valence electrons to lose to form a beryllium 2 plus cation to empty the valence shell to become like helium. At the same time, nitrogen, a group 5A nonmetal, is seeking to gain three electrons to fill the valence shell to become isoelectronic with neon. When it combines with a metal, it's able to do that because the metal will give the electrons that the nitrogen accepts, forming a nitride 3 minus anion. Now you can see, looking at the charges, these are not going to combine in a one-to-one -one ratio because the total positive charge and negative charge are not equal. So what would be the lowest combining ratio of these to give the total positive charge equal to the total negative charge? And I think by inspection you could see that if we multiplied equation 1 here by 3 and formed 3 beryllium atoms, releasing a total of 6 electrons, forming 3 beryllium cations, and multiply this second equation by two, so two nitrogens gaining six electrons. Electrons gained is equal to get electrons lost. will give us two of these nitride three minus anions. I think you can probably see now that this will give us a total positive charge of plus six, a total negative charge of minus six, which is the ratio that they will combine in. So the Lewis structure would be three Be2 plus and two nitride 3 minus. And the formula of that compound is then simply Be3N2. Notice in chemical formulas that we always write the number of atoms as a subscript after the symbol of the element, and that's beryllium nitride. 
Let's look next at the combination of aluminum and oxygen. So aluminum is a group 3A metal seeking to lose three electrons and form a 3 plus cation. At the same time, oxygen, a group 6A nonmetal, only requires two electrons to fill its valence shell to become isoelectronic with neon. When that happens, you can see that these will not combine in a one-to-one -one ratio because the total charge, positive and negative, are not equal. So again, what would be the combining ratio we would need here? What would happen? Well, you can see that if we multiply this first equation by two, we'd have two aluminums releasing six electrons, forming two aluminum plus three cations, and multiply the second equation by three, so three oxygens gaining six electrons. Electrons gained is equal to electrons lost, producing three oxide two minus anions. Then the total positive charge of plus six is the same as the total negative charge of negative six, and that is the combining ratio, and here is the correct Lewis structure, two Al3 plus and three O2 minus, and the formula would be Al2O3 aluminum oxide. Now, this process of finding the total positive charge, total negative charge ion ratio is sometimes called finding the lowest common multiple. So in this case, we're saying that six is the lowest common multiple of both two and three. So six is a multiple of two, in other words, two times three is six, and six is also a multiple of three, two times three is six, so it's a common multiple of both two and three. And it happens to be the lowest common multiple of two and three, so it's called the lowest common multiple. We're trying to find that. Now, think about the number 12. 12 is also a common multiple of both two and three. Two divides into 12 six times, and three divides into 12 four times, so it is a common multiple, but it's not the lowest common multiple. And we write formulas, chemical formulas, as the lowest common multiple, Al203. A shortcut to finding a ratio of cations and anions that produce the same total positive and negative charge is called the inverse rule. Simply the charge of one ion is written as the multiplier of the other. Again, the charge of one ion is written as the multiplier of the other, and hence we would write Al203. This works very neatly. Let's look at an example of lead combining with oxygen. Now, lead is a group 4A metal. It would like to lose all four valence electrons and form a lead 4 plus ion. At the same time, oxygen, we've seen as a group 6A nonmetal, only needing two electrons to fill this valence shell and form an oxide 2 minus anion. So looking at these charges, you can probably quickly say, well, if we had two oxygens releasing a total of four electrons, number of electrons gained equal number of electrons lost, we'd have two oxide minus two, and that would be the correct combining ratio such that the total positive charge of plus four will be equal to the total negative charge of minus four. So for its Lewis structure, we would write Pb four plus and two O two minus. And its formula then is PbO2, lead oxide. Now just a word of caution, if you use the inverse rule, remember to reduce the ion ratio to the lowest whole number ratio because we always write a formula unit for the formula of an ionic compound and by definition that is the lowest whole number ratio of ions. So in the case of lead oxide, if we use the inverse rule, it would give a formula like this, four plus becomes the multiplier of four for the oxygen, two minus becomes the multiplier of two for the lead, we'd write Pb2O4. And although that's the correct combination of total positive charge equals total negative charge, plus eight minus eight, it is not the lowest whole number ratio. You must remember to reduce that to the lowest whole number ratio, in this case, dividing by two to get PbO2. Okay, a couple more examples. Strontium combining with sulfur. So strontium is in group 2A like magnesium, loses two electrons, producing a strontium 2 plus cation. Sulfur is in group 6A like oxygen, 
would like to gain two electrons, and if it's combined with a metal that's willing to give them, we have a happy arrangement in which sulfide forms S minus 2 anion. And obviously, looking at the charges, the total positive and total negative charge are equal in a one-to-one -one ratio, and that's all we need to do. So here's the correct Lewis structure of strontium sulfide. The formula is SRS in a one-to-one -one ratio. Its name is strontium sulfide. One more here. Potassium and chlorine. Potassium is in group 1A, which is to lose one electron and form a potassium plus one cation. Chlorine is in group 7A. It needs one electron to fill the valence shell to become isoelectronic with argon. And so it does. And so these combine in a one-to-one -one ratio. So the number of electrons lost by the metal is equal to the number of electrons gained by the nonmetal, and thus the total positive charge is equal to the total negative charge. These will combine in a one-to-one -one ratio, KCl potassium chloride. Now when electrons are transferred from metals to nonmetals, the metal cations, as for example lithium in this example, and nonmetal anions, like fluorine in this example, are held together by an ionic bond between a lithium cation and a fluoride anion. Now this bond is actually the electrostatic attraction of oppositely charged ions. So when A group metals react with nonmetals, the metals typically empty the valence shells, the nonmetals fill their valence shells, both becoming isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. In this case, lithium cation is isoelectronic with helium, and fluoride anion is isoelectronic with neon. Now, when nonmetals, look down here, hydrogen, for example, bond with other nonmetals or metalloids, neither atom can take or give electrons, and so they must share electrons to become isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. In the reaction below, we see both covalently bonded hydrogen atoms here have two electrons in their valence shell. So they become isoelectronic with helium. But you ask, where does the strength of the covalent bond come from? Well, actually, it's the electrostatic attraction of the shared negatively charged electron pair between the positively charged nuclei of the atoms. So it's still an electrostatic attraction that's present in covalent bonds, but it's typically weaker than that in ionic bonds. However, it still takes considerable energy to break covalent bonds, particularly for double and triple covalent bonds. So the next important question is, how do we know if a bond between two atoms is ionic or covalent? So when the student is first introduced to chemical bonds, a simplification is often presented. You might be told, well, metal to nonmetal bonds are ionic, and nonmetal to nonmetal or metalloid bonds are covalent. Well, it is certainly true that nonmetal to nonmetal or metalloid bonds are always covalent. They are never ionic. It is not true that all metal to nonmetal bonds are ionic. In truth, only some are ionic. Now, the polarity. The dielectric strength of bonds can be measured to assess the amount of ionic character present in a bond. And the melting point of a compound is a good indication of ionic character of a bond. Do you remember that ionic compounds are all high melting solids, typically melting points greater than or equal to 400 Celsius, whereas covalent compounds are gases or liquids, or if they are solids, they're low melting solids with a melting point less than or equal to 300 degrees Celsius. But irrespective of these tests, there is no quick, simple calculation that can be used to predict which metal to nonmetal compounds are ionic, at least not always correctly. There are two electronegativity scales in use that easily calculate ionic character of a bond, but neither of these is completely accurate. It just can't be that simple. But here they are presented. Here's one scale in which the difference in electronegativity is calculated and compared. Let me show you an example here. Just calculate the difference in electronegativity of two atoms and match this value to the values in the scale. For example, calcium chloride would be predicted to be ionic because the difference 
This is delta, the difference in electronegativity of chlorine to calcium is 3.0 electronegativity of chlorine minus 1.0 electronegativity of calcium is 2.0. 2.0 just falls within the bottom end of the ionic region. Now when you do this calculation, make sure you always subtract the smaller value from the larger value. We always want a positive difference. There are no negative values on this scale. Now look at beryllium hydride. It would be predicted to be polar covalent because the difference in electronegativity, hydrogen to beryllium, 2.1 minus 1.5 is 0.6, and that would fall just here in the lower end of the polar covalent bond. And by the way, these electronegativity values are readily available from Linus Pauling's electronegativity value, which you would most certainly be provided with on a test. And finally, look at oxygen, O2. Well, it has to be nonpolar covalent because the difference in electronegativity, in this case, oxygen to oxygen, is 3.5 minus 3.5 is 0, and there it is nonpolar. So typically, anything between 0 and 0.4 is considered to be nonpolar between 0.5 and 2 depending how you read this as polar covalent, and then above, two and above is ionic. But we have a problem here. Sodium sulfide has a melting point of 1176 degrees Celsius, and that is clearly ionic. Similarly, calcium sulfide melts at 25, 25 degrees C, clearly ionic. But the foregoing scale would predict these both to be polar covalent. I'm working out one example here to show you. The difference in electronegativity between the sulfur and sodium bond, 2.5 minus 1.0 is 1.5, which would fall in the polar covalent range. And clearly, that, that's not correct. And there are other incorrect predictions. So there is an electronegativity scale that gives better bond-type predictions, and that's shown below. Now, it still isn't perfect. It gives rise to some wrong predictions, but it is more reliable and it's arguably just as easy to use. So when you calculate the difference in electronegativity for metals to nonmetals, use the upper scale. This one here. You'll see you have nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. When you calculate the difference in electronegativity for nonmetal to nonmetal or metalloid bonds, we're going to use the lower scale here. Notice on the lower scale we have 0 to 0.4 is nonpolar, 0.5 to 2.2 is polar covalent, and it doesn't show any ionic values, and that's because nonmetal, nonmetal bonds don't form any ionic bonds. They're always some type of covalent bond. If we look at the difference in electronegativity of sodium sulfide as 1.5, you see it does fall within the ionic region in the scale, likewise calcium sulfide wood, and other values that would fail on the other scale. So in this intro chemistry course, you'll be given this second scale to use to predict bond type. And it's no more difficult to use, and certainly gives better predictions of bond type. And that's it for this short video. Thanks for listening.